Welcome. My name is Cindy Rowe, and I am chair of the Brookline Democratic Town Committee. The committee is the local organization of the Mass State Democratic Party, and we make sure that Brookline residents can engage with their local elected officials, participate on ballot questions, and learn about public policy issues. Tonight, we are holding a debate between the two candidates for the Norfolk District 15 state representative seat. This includes Brookline precincts 1 to 4, 5A, 6 to 12, and 17. We will be discussing issues of concern to Brookline voters. Thanks to those of you who sent in questions ahead of this debate. While we might not get to all of them, I do hope that the questions will allow the candidates to touch on many areas of interest to you. Our thanks to the staff at Brookline Interactive Group for making this evening possible. The content of the program is solely the responsibility of the producer, Brookline Democratic Town Committee. All of Brookline residents are welcome to use Big's resources as members. Visit brooklineinteractive.org to learn more or to support Big. The format of our debate tonight will be to allow each candidate to have an opening statement. We will then share with them some questions. Each candidate will be allowed a two-minute response to each question and then a 30-second follow-up. We will then have a lightning round of questions and closing statements. We expect the debate to take approximately one hour. The candidates participated in a coin toss, and that's how we decided the, tonight's order. So now we turn to our candidates, State Representative Tommy Vitolo and former Vice Chair of the Select Board, Dr. Raul Fernandez. We are ready for our opening statements, and we are starting with Raul. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you to the Democratic Town Committee for hosting this conversation and to BIG for broadcasting it. My name is Raul Fernandez. I'm a member of the Massachusetts Democratic State Committee, a union member, a renter in Coolidge Corner, a former select board vice chair, and a dad, and I'm excited to be here today. I'm a proud Democrat because ours is the party of working people. Climate action, housing affordability, access to abortion, and great public schools for every student. Our Democratic State Committee, on our Democratic State Committee, I've seen how the work of party activists has given us a progressive party platform, from universal childcare to debt-free public college to major investments in housing and healthcare. I'm running because we need a state representative who will fight for the values of our party. Democrats have held a veto-proof majority in the legislature since 1992. It's our responsibility to use it to enact transformative policy change. But session after session, our legislature and my opponent have put political convenience over transformative progress, failing to pass the policies our party elected them to support. Our Democratic Party platform calls for ending the statewide ban on rent control, but my opponent voted against repeal. We Democrats stand for transparency measures, but three of my opponent's first votes in the legislature were to block them. I'll take a different approach. I know from my track record of bringing people together in Brookline that we have everything we need to make our town and our state a place where everyone can thrive. And I know personally that we need transformative change because our current approach is not working for my family and not for so many of yours either. As the only renter in this race, I know that we need abundant and affordable housing and rent stabilization. As a dad of a one-year-old, I know that we have the highest childcare costs in the country and it's not even close. As the only union member in this race, I know we need to support organizing everywhere, and I'm proud to have been endorsed by my union, SEIU 509, SEIU 888, and the Massachusetts Teachers Association, the largest union in New England. Commitments to make meaningful change on these issues uh, in the Democratic part, Party platform, <clears throat> excuse me, commitments to make meaningful change on these issues in the Democratic Party platform are areas where this legislature has not taken substantial action in years. We don't have to settle for an action. I know because I've taken a different approach in Brookline, leading successful efforts to secure local support for our public housing, to reimagine our public safety system, to support small businesses and nonprofits through our ongoing pandemic, and to negotiate a just settlement with firefighter Gerald Alston. I'm proud that progressive champions in Brookline and beyond, champions like Jesse Mermel, Miriam Ashkenazi, Natalia Linos, Joe Kennedy, and Sonia Chang Diaz are supporting my campaign. I'm running for state rep because Brookline deserves a representative who will fight for the transformative change we need, and I hope that I can earn your vote by September 6th. Tommy. Thank you, Brookline Interactive Group, the Brookline Democratic Town Committee, 
and everyone who helped organize this conversation. My name is Tommy Vitolo, and I have served as Brookline State Representative for the past four years. I've been active in local government for the past 15. I grew up in a scrappy New England town, and in sixth grade, for just a moment, my parents weren't able to make ends meet. We were evicted from our 1,300 square foot home, and I learned what it is to be vulnerable. And I also came to understand deeply how government can raise people up when and where they need it most. I moved to Brookline about 20 years ago to pursue a PhD in engineering. And after graduating, I went to work for Barack Obama's EPA, for Democratic Attorneys General, for the Sierra Club and the NRDC, fighting to force the closure of coal-fired power plants across the country against the wishes of their owners. I gained deep expertise in energy and climate policy and have taken that expertise with me to the State House where I have helped to shape and pass two climate bills, one signed into law just a few weeks ago that allows Brookline and nine other communities the authority to restrict the installation of, car of carbon dioxide emitting uh, heating systems in new, in new construction and in deep renovations. My 15 years of experience at town meeting have taught me that the key to not being merely a champion, but in fact someone who successfully passes legislation, is communication, cooperation, collaboration, consensus building, and yes, compromise. I've taken those skills with me to the State House, not just to be successful on climate, but also to help shape and pass police reform, legislation that will result in the creation of more housing, laws that will improve the delivery of both physical and mental health care, a dramatic increase in funding for public education, protection of immigrants and of civil rights, and an abortion law so strong that Vice President Kamala Harris came to town, to, to Boston, to meet with me and several other legislators about that bill. I'm not satisfied, though. I'm proud of my work but there is more to do. And that's why I'm running for re-election, and that's why I'm asking for you, voters in the Democratic primary on September 6th, to cast your vote for me, Tommy Vitolo. I look forward to tonight's conversation. Thank you. So this question will go to Tommy first. And the question is about your background. Let's dig in a little on, on both of your backgrounds. So, Raul, for you, your background is in education, and that's what you have pursued. And, Tommy, you pursued a career in environmental science. So, why did you choose those subjects? And how does having those backgrounds lead you to be a better overall candidate for state representative? And, Tommy, you are answering first. Sure. So, at Boston University, I earned a PhD in engineering, which involved some uh, teaching in classrooms. Uh, and an awful lot of uh, work on whiteboards and chalkboards. And a few years into my education, I saw a movie at the Coolidge Corner Theater starring a former Vice President, Al Gore. And it clicked that every single problem we face, everything we care about, is harder in a world of climate change. Poverty becomes more severe with drought and famine. Wars become more severe driven by uh, this, these changes in climate. And you go down the list. Every pain is exacerbated. And furthermore, unlike so many other problems, climate change has a short fuse. If we don't fix it now, we never can. And so those other problems are important. But climate change has this short fuse. And so I realized that what I needed to do was, uh, when I finished my PhD, work on that problem. And my engineering background was a nice fit for me to become an expert witness and testify before public utility commissions across the country on behalf of Democratic Attorneys General, Barack Obama's EPA, NRDC, and Sierra Club, to force the closure of coal-fired power plants, to allow for the construction of more solar and wind, more energy efficiency, uh, and doing it in ways that help not just fight climate change, 
but help environmental justice communities because that's where the pollution hits the hardest. Uh, and so uh, working there for, uh, for about 10 years, I realized that the most effective way to fight climate change and all these other problems is not merely to work on one plant at a time, but to go change the laws that govern our society so that we can most quickly, most fairly, and most efficiently fight these problems head on. And that's what I've been doing at the State House. Thank you, Tommy. Raul? Yes, thanks, Cindy. Uh, so I'm a faculty member, a senior lecturer at Boston University's Wheelock College of Education and Human Development. Uh, I focus on educational equity, um, and that is because it is the story of my life. Uh, I grew up in uh, New York in El Barrio and later in the South Bronx. Uh, was raised uh, for a time in public housing uh, by my folks who were both transit workers, union workers. Um, my father started uh, cleaning trains at night. Uh, later on uh, was a conductor, the folks that open and close the doors and make the announcements. And then later on was uh, what they then called a motorman, now we call a more gender inclusive term, train operator. They're the ones that drive the trains and that's what my sister does in New York right now. Uh, my mother actually was working on the city buses. She was a bus mechanic for most of my life. Uh, she actually worked on the air conditioning units on the buses. And we didn't have much. And so after school, my sister and I spent a lot of time at train yards and bus depots in the break rooms. And that was our child care. Uh, there was something that happened uh, for me in education just at the, at the age of four. Uh, there was a teacher, Miss Friedlander, who had to decide who amongst the four-year-olds in her class she was going to recommend for this talented and gifted program. And now as an educator, I know that there is, there is no daylight between four-year-olds uh, in terms of their talents or gifts or um, what they can become, uh, yet they had this program that I was recommended for, which of course puts you on a well-resourced path uh, to places like exam public schools like Manhattan East and Bronx Science, and ultimately that's what got me as an undergrad to Boston University. Uh, but the path not taken was very different. I would have gone uh, in high school to my round-the-way school, which was called Stevenson High School, which was only graduating three out of every 10 students that went there, just 30% graduating, never mind going on to places like BU. I share this to say that different opportunities lead to different outcomes. My work here in Brookline, my work at Boston University, and my work at the State House will be making sure um, to level the playing field so that all kids and all people have the same opportunities as anyone else with a real focus, and, and this, is, this is a big difference here, a real focus on building power for those who need it most. Thank you, Raul. Our next question goes, 30 oh, sorry, 30 seconds. 30 seconds um, to Tommy. You know, one of the first, uh, the first two, in fact, folks I supported uh, in democratic politics in Massachusetts both stemmed from my experience in energy. The first was Deval Patrick, who was pushing for what was then called Cape Wind. He was right then, and he's still right, and we're gonna get there. In fact, we just did legislation. But the second one was Maura Healy when she ran for Attorney General, and it was because of her experience and pushing forward on energy issues. And that's why I'm so excited she's running for governor and why she's Thank endorsed you. me. Oh, 30 seconds. Sure. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just add, you know, I'm, I'm proud to be an appointed member of the Racial Imbalance Advisory Council at the Mass Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, uh, where we focus on the deep racial inequities that exist in our school system across the Commonwealth. Uh, and yeah, that exist here in Brookline as well. We've seen numerous reports on that at this point. Uh, and it is impossible at this point for us to consider our our education and our schools exceptional if they are not working for students with special needs and if they are not working for students of color and students from underpaid backgrounds. Um, that is going to be also my focus at the State House. Thank you. Our next question goes to Raul first. Social, economic, and racial justice. This is a phrase that we use quite often, but I want to get down to what that phrase really means to you. What changes need to happen in our state to achieve that? And give us a few concrete examples. Okay. Um, that's, a, that's a big topic, Sandy, but, but let's get into it. And, um, you know, my, my position has always been policy over platitudes and resources over rhetoric. Um, I am, uh, like many folks out there, um, you know, probably a little sick of, of folks saying the right things, but not backing it up when the moment comes, when there's a real opportunity to show leadership through policy and there's a real opportunity to show leadership through directing resources to the folks who need it most. Um, we've seen it right here in Brookline. Um, you know, we had, the, the reason I ran for select board in the first place was because I sat there um, as select board members fired two police officers of color 
who had complained about racial discrimination. And rather than root out that discrimination in the police department, uh, the select board chose to fire them. Um, speaking, while the select board uh, quietly took a vote, um, it was a full room there, uh, was Gerald Alston, um, a firefighter in Brookline who had been fired under similar, similar circumstances. Uh, and so we are a community where people are, are apt to say things like Black Lives Matter. Um, but when we have these issues happening right here in our community, there's a real question about who speaks up and who doesn't. Um, I fought um, and I pledged when I ran for the select board to fight for a just uh, outcome for, for Gerald Alston, as just an outcome as we could possibly muster. Um, and that's exactly what I did. And I didn't do it alone. I worked in coalition with town meeting members, racial justice advocates, and so many other people to deliver a settlement that, 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 that made just, uh, Gerald Alston as whole as we possibly could, but that also sent a message to our community that there is a cost to racial injustice. There is a cost to racism. Um, that is the work that I am going to continue to do at the State House. Uh, you know, we need to move beyond these platitudes. We need to put resources where they're needed. Uh, and we need to stop um, with, with just saying that we care about racial justice and actually put our actions where our mouth is. You know, I, you know, I, I unfortunately, you. I thought I had, there was still more time, sorry. You mind if I finish? Uh, you know, unfortunately, this is one area where um, when those of us were in the fight for Gerald um, and on so many other issues, we could have used a state rep that was with us. We didn't have that. Tommy. Yeah, you know, uh, look, we know we need to lift up those who need support. And we know that uh, those needs come from hundreds of years of deliberate actions by people uh, who came before me, uh, before all of us in many cases. And so at the State House, my focus has been both local and larger. Locally, I fought for MEDCO, which helps uh, not just students in Boston, but also students in the region uh, learn uh, to embrace differences and learn to work together. Um, I fought for funding successfully for the Senior Center. We know uh, seniors are overwhelmingly suffering from economic challenges, and they too need support. I made sure I was able to get them support. Also. Uh, another great organization, Steps to Success, right? They take kids who live in Brookline housing and they get them through college. They get them into uh, young adulthood successfully. Similarly, the Brookline Teen Center, another organization that I've been able to support with local earmarks. At the state level though, you know, we've, we've accomplished big things. They're down payments on getting us to an equal and just society. They don't get us there. But we passed a police reform bill. That was really important. And it has a long list of wins that were uh, pursued by, successfully by the Black and Latino Legislative Caucus, amendments that I joined them in the fight for. Uh, just recently, uh, the federal government took away funding for free school lunches. We at the state, we put it back. We said that's important enough. Kids can't possibly learn when they're hungry we made sure that we restored that funding. We also put money into housing and transportation, two places where folks at the bottom end of the economic spectrum are going to struggle more. I've walked the walk. Thank you, Tom. Our next question goes to, oh, seconds? sorry, 30 seconds. Yeah. 30 seconds. Uh, no problem. Uh, so, you know, I'll just say this, is, is voting the right way and walking the walk. Um, walking the walk is actually building with other people and creating. Creating, as I did, a task force to reimagine policing in Brookline in very difficult times where, again, we could have used the state rep to step into that space and help bring people to the table. We did not get that support from our state rep. It's putting together a town BHA working group to focus on the BHA, the Brookline Housing Authority, and make sure the resources, they get the resources they need. It's a whole lot more, um, and we have not been getting enough support from our state Thank representative. You, With me, you will. Tommy. Your state rep was not busy uh, working on policies that didn't get enacted. Instead, he was working to pass police reform legislation, laws that did get enacted, chokeholds that are prohibited, search warrant restrictions that are now enforced, right? Again, uh, walking the walk isn't talking about things, it's working with others to pass legislation. It's that cooperation and that communication I talked about earlier. I've been working hard at the State House. 
on issues of social, economic, and racial justice, and I will keep doing so at the State House at the state level. Thank you. Our next question goes to Tommy first. This question is about education, preschool, K-12, higher ed, and vocational education. Where does our system need to improve, and how will we get there? For every person, uh, not just pre-K through vocational, but even adults and older adults uh, who aren't able to access the academic structure and support they need, it needs to improve, right? Uh, we're not there yet. Brook I'm proud of Brookline's public schools. My students, uh, my, my kids are students at Pierce School, uh, rising second and sixth graders. Uh, and Brookline uh, may be a leader in Massachusetts, but remember, Massachusetts is a leader in the nation for K through 12. And I'm proud of that. Uh, and I was proud to put more money into K through 12 education, specifically in the poorest communities through the Student Opportunity Act. And I have made sure that we have kept our promise and increased that funding every year, just as we said we would. Pre-K is brutally expensive. I know, uh, I've, I paid for it for a total of about 10 years. Uh, it's also amongst the best pre-K in the country. We have the highest ratios of teachers to students. It's what drives the cost. It also makes it better. And we've got to figure out ways uh, through vouchers, uh, through cost sharing, through all kinds of ways, including I'd like to see uh, more public uh, support of early ed programs like BEEP. Uh, we don't do enough for UMass, state colleges, and other state universities. I've pushed for us to do more. Uh, I, I attended North Carolina State University, and the state of North Carolina does a better job funding higher ed than the state of Massachusetts does. That's, that's fact, and the tuition, uh, the tuition bills show for it. Uh, vocational vocational uh, trades and, and schools are also critical. Not everyone is meant for college, but everyone's meant to be productive. Uh, you bet we need to do more work there, uh, and I'll keep working Thank on you. it. Thank you. Um, let, let me spend the first part of this question correcting some misrepresentations from the prior question because, um, you know, it is um, beyond condescending for someone who says that they care about racial justice to claim that a person of color who's been doing racial justice work in Brookline has had no outcomes and done nothing when you must know better. You must know that recommendations from the task force to reimagine policing in Brookline were adopted by the select board and by the school committee and by the Brookline Housing Authority. You must know that, so why you would represent, misrepresent that to the folks here is completely beyond me. You must know um, that I helped get passed and then shepherd through the process, the Racial Equity Advancement Fund, which is putting meaningful dollars into programs, including one that you just name checked earlier. You must know that, and if not, I guess you're not paying attention. As it relates to education, this is something I could talk about. We should have an entire session on education, but let me touch upon a few areas here. Um, the first thing that I wanna work on when getting into the legislature is fixing our broken childcare system and working to make sure that universal pre-K becomes a reality, not just in our community, but across the, the Commonwealth. I have talked to too many folks in Brookline who receive these vouchers that do not cover the full cost of childcare and by the way, are not required to be accepted by anybody in Brookline, and too many people in our community actually, actually have to use their voucher somewhere outside of our community. That is completely wrong. It needs to get fixed. On public college, public college should no question be absolutely tuition free. Um, we can do that. Uh, and by the way, we are shamefully one of the few states in the nation um, that, is, that, that is democratically controlled that actually um, treats undocumented students and students with DACA status as international students, making them pay full tuition at our public colleges. That too needs to end, and that needs to end in the next legislative session. Um, make no mistake about it, um, I'm the education champion in this race. I'm proud to be endorsed by the Mass Teachers Association. I will be fighting for kids and also folks in higher education. 30 seconds to Tommy. You know, like a lot of issues in this race, um, my opponent and I have very similar viewpoints. Uh, the idea that one of us is an education champion uh, doesn't, doesn't fly with me. I've been endorsed by the Boston Teachers Union, and, uh, and I was walking the walk when it came to 
the Student Opportunity Act and making sure it will be funded. My opponent promises he'll help make sure it's been, it'll be funded on his flyer. I have, in fact, been there making Thank sure you. it's been funded. I've been walking the walk. Raul? My question I've been, I've been dying to ask is where were you? Where were you when we were having difficult um, uh, conversations, fights even, around policing in our community? Um, where were you for Gerald Alston? Where were you when um, Brookline for Racial Justice and Equity has consistently been pushing our schools to do better around equity? Where have you been? We could have used a state rep in our corner and you weren't there. For someone that came to, claims to, to care about social justice and has repeatedly, including this year, defended um, having Columbus Day be a holiday in Massachusetts is completely beyond me. We're a community that celebrates Indigenous Peoples our, Day um, and that defense next, is, is, is unconscionable at this point. Our next question goes to Raul first. Uh, there is a lack of affordable housing across our state. How um, do you, would you think about addressing the need for more affordable housing? Yeah. Another big question, Sadie. Uh, so, so really, here are the things we need to do. One is we need a greater abundance of housing, no question about it, in our communities. But I think we also need to start taking control over where that housing um, is built and who's building it. I think we need to move more housing out of the private sector into the public sector. One of the ways that we can do that is through the real estate transfer fee that we passed here in Brookline. Uh, my opponent was not for it. I think he says now he is. Um, and that would have already generated $50 million in just two and a half years to build and preserve permanently affordable housing in our community. Um, it is $50 million too late. We still need the legislature to act on this. They haven't. I've been calling on the legislature to return into session um, this year to pass these home row petitions that have been sent not just by Brookline, but multiple communities that want to use this tool to create and preserve permanently affordable housing in our community. It would be a game changer. Um, the other thing we need to do is make sure that we put in tenant protections. Again, something that my opponent has voted against in the past. Um, most importantly, rent stabilization. What does that mean? Rent stabilization is making sure that people who rent have reasonable and predictable rent increases. It is the same kind of protection that uh, homeowners get right now through Prop 2 and a half. Renters have no protections whatsoever. And that means that older folks who want to make our community their last community are worried, and I've talked to them about this at the doors, worried that they're gonna get priced out of their community, priced out of their house of worship, priced out of their coffee shop, priced out of the, their friends in their neighborhood and forced to leave. Likewise, there are people that um, right now in Brookline are raising kids here and want to take advantage of our schools in Brookline. They too are concerned about whether or not they'll be able to continue living um, you know, in Brookline throughout the time that their kids are in school. I'm the owner, only renter in this race. This is real for me, it's real for my family, and I guarantee I'll be fighting for, um, for everybody in this community. Tommy. You know, the, the cost of housing in Brookline, it, it's really hard. It was really hard 20 years ago when I moved to Brookline as a renter uh, and rented at the corner of St. Mary's and Mount Fort, a 399 square foot apartment. The problem with housing in the Boston metropolitan area is there's not enough of it. This is a great place to live. People want to live here. People want to move here. Those who come to school here want to stay here. There's great jobs. There's great culture. And there are simply not enough places to live. And so I voted in favor of a bill uh, that became law in December 2020, uh, signed in January 2021, that will create more housing in the private sector where, where the money is to pay for it, not just in one or two communities, but in 175 communities. In all of the communities served by the MBTA, commuter rail system, subway system, bus system. We required each and every community to ensure that there was buildability, that you could create housing around each and every commuter rail stop, subway stop, major bus stop because no one community can carry the load no one community can build their way out of this housing crunch we need all hands on deck we need a regional approach we need a broad approach and anything we do that signals to the people who build new housing that they should take their business elsewhere only slows that down we need the housing and the way we get the housing is for each city and town to take the lid off the ability to build housing in their community. 
For 15 years in Brookline, I've supported adding density in Brookline. I filed the real estate transfer fee home rule petition for Brookline. And contrary to my opponent's assertion last time and this time, I have supported that real estate transfer fee continuously. Thank you, Tom. Right. Raul? Um, you, could, you can find this uh, on my Twitter and a website where it clearly shows that he didn't. Um, let me just say this also. Um, as it relates to, to supporting um, folks in our community, I was the only select board member to support a senior property tax exemption. Um, I worked collaboratively to get a small area fair market rent designation for Brookline, which meant that folks that had Section 8 vouchers who could not afford to live in Brookline um, had the value of that voucher go up. And I just got the numbers in just yesterday. We saw, after that intervention, a 39% increase in the number of people in Brookline who were able to lease up with a Section 8 voucher. Um, the last thing I'll say is this. You know that I am the person Thank that's you, fighting Ronald. for... I'm oh, sorry, I couldn't tell what the time. Can I just finish the thought? Yes, yeah. finish your sentence. All right. You know that I'm the person that's fighting um, for, for renters and those who need it most in our community because there's a real estate pack that's actually okay. going to be spending $8,000 supporting we're gonna finish. my opponent. Thank you. Tommy? Um, my opponent's focused on the rules but can't seem to keep track of the time rules in this debate. Uh, look, uh, my opponent is trying to obfuscate the real estate transfer tax. It's actually quite simple. Town meeting member Deb Brown asked me to co-sponsor a Senate bill. I said I wouldn't because of a specific provision that we discussed here in this last debate. I have co-sponsored the House version of the bill. I wanted to see if I could get movement on that before I signed on. I, was, I have so far been unable to get movement on that. None of that changes the fact that I have continued to support Brookline's home rule since it passed town meeting. And when my opponent says to the contrary, he's not being straight with you. Thank you. Our next question uh, will go to Tommy first. This question is about transportation. So the MBTA is clearly in crisis, which is making us realize just how critical it is to our economy and keeping cars off the road and how fragile our entire transportation system is. Talk to us about the role of public transportation in your life and what to do to improve its reliability in the future. I've lived in Brookline 20 years. I have a wife and two children. We have not owned a car. We take the T, we take a bike, blue bike. Uh, we take Ubers and Lyfts occasionally, borrow rides. Uh, but we ride the T an awful lot. Not just the Green Line, but predominantly the Green Line, the 66 bus, uh, the 65 bus. And uh, for the first time in 20 years, I now worry a little bit before I get on. We've got to get the T working again. And we've got to get people believing in it again. We'll get there through performance. And that's why uh, I'm so glad uh, to have the opportunity to work next year if reelected with Maura Healy. Governor Baker has driven the T to the ground. He supported capital projects well enough, but has underinvested in people. And that's what the National Transportation Safety Board has said. Uh, and that matches his, uh, his leadership style. Maura Healy, on the other hand, uh, is a different animal altogether. I have no doubt. Uh, she's going to work with the legislature, not at cross purposes, to support the MBTA, to support the operators, the mechanics, the people who work at the T to make sure that that T is running safely. At the local level, I've had a number of successes working directly with the MBTA. When the sea line was shut down during COVID, at my persuasion, uh, General Manager Poftak had installed sensors and actuators uh, on the green line, which means the C line now gets the green light. When it's coming, the green light holds for it. And riders coming from Cleveland Circle to St. Mary's get there four to seven minutes faster each trip each day. That can add up to be over 100 hours for a commuter over the course of a year. And just next door to where we are right now, at the Brookline Hills T-Stop, I stepped in and ensured that the station wasn't built with the mind uh, just of students, but also of the riders. And as a result, we got a great pavilion and a much better stop for riders right here at Brookline Hills. Thank you, Tommy. Raul. Thank you. Um, before we get into transportation, I just want to say for folks watching at home, why don't you hit rewind, go back another question, and see if you heard uh, our state representative talk anything um, about affordability in housing. Um, see if you heard him address the question of rent stabilization, whether he's for it or against it. 
Um, you heard him talk a lot about building, 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 and more building. And we see that without the right controls in place, that leads to luxury homes in our community, but not a lot of homes for those who need it most. Um, I urge you to go back, watch that question, see if you think you got a good answer to that question. And as a reminder, rent stabilization is part of the Democratic Party platform. Uh, and we have someone, we're not really sure if he supports it or not, because he ain't saying. I'll say this too, um, look on his website, see if you can get an answer there. There are literally no policy positions on his website. Compare that with my website, I'm telling you exactly what I believe, including about transportation, which is also um, in detail on my website. The time I have left, let me say this. Um, I've been um, working with and fighting uh, others in our community in Boston and Cambridge and fighting for a fare free uh, bus pilot, uh, the 66 bus in Brookline. Uh, you know, I think that, uh, frankly, we could make the, the, the bus lines fare free right now and that we actually should be doing that right now. And I think we have some work to do to make sure that we can make all transit fare free in Massachusetts. But that's the transit we deserve. Um, and with the right investments in the right places, um, we actually could make that happen. Um, I was a regular 57 bus commuter when I lived in Brighton. Um, more recently, um, I either walk or take the T to Boston University from, uh, from where I live. I will tell you this much, I have sat like, or stood like too many people waiting for that green line to come in the morning only to see that it is completely packed and I could not get on. And another one would pass and another one and another one. We have disinvested in this system way longer than just the tenure of Charlie Baker. We need to start taking ownership as Democrats, folks. We cannot continue to blame everyone and anyone else for the failures of our system. We need to own it. We need to fix it. Tommy. You want to know my positions, just listen to my answers. I don't spend an awful lot of time backtracking on previous questions. Uh, look, uh, we rely on transportation, and it's not just about climate, and it's not just about uh, getting people to work. It's about economic justice. It's about making sure everyone has access to resources. And it's about housing. With better transportation, folks can get to and from work from more places, and it opens up more ideals. Uh, I've been working on transportation steadily, and I'm going to keep doing it. Thank you. Raul. You know, I'll say the one thing that we do know about what our opponent believes comes from the progressive mass questionnaire, which they made public. Uh, we know that he has floated the idea of means tested rent control, which is such a bad idea. I can't believe he actually put it down on paper. Um, he's also uh, floated the idea of folks in Brookline paying for the tea and to, for investments that are happening elsewhere outside of Brookline. Again, the only thing that actually works that's going to make the system efficient, that's going to make it affordable, that's going to make it work for the people who need it most is to make that system free, at least fare free. And we need to start working toward a plan to make that happen. Thank is it you. gonna happen tomorrow? I don't think so, but if we don't start working on it right our now, next, it ain't gonna happen at all. Our next question goes to Raul first. Uh, we have seen scorching temperatures this summer, just one example of how impactful climate change will be to our future well-being. Let's take it local. Massachusetts has approved a climate change roadmap what are some of the things that the legislature has to do next to make this a reality? Okay, and let me start by focusing locally because I think we've done some really good things here locally. Um, I'm glad to have been uh, one of the select board members that created our zero emissions advisory board. And not only that, and that, that's a, a board that focuses specifically on decarbonization uh, and related efforts, and they report directly um, to the top, to the town administrator. But not only that, to ensure that one of the five seats on that board actually is dedicated to environmental justice. Because I tell you what, when we take big swings, um, we can do big things, but we also tend to forget about the people that need it most when we take those swings. As an example, um, when I was young, uh, you know, I remember living in the South Bronx and across the street from me, we would have these trucks backing up the beep, beep, beep of the backing up trucks, dumping something in a lot across the street from us. It was asbestos. Uh, and only until the news camera showed up that we even know that that was happening to us in our community. What happened this very same year? We saw that the same thing happen in Chelsea, uh, a stone's throw away from public housing. The state was dumping asbestos. We have not learned our lessons and we need more folks that are in the legislature that actually understand the impacts on underpaid people, on communities of color, and on indigenous folks as well. That's what we need to focus on. Um, the other thing I wanna say locally is this, is that we certainly need to invest in increasing our tree canopy in the places where it is not built up enough. We have a great urban forestry master plan that we should be enacting. Uh, and also, um, I've been working uh, on, uh, with others uh, through the Small Business Development Committee and through my, some of the work um, through, through the diversity efforts that I work on 
to ensure that we actually take these lots, these parking lots that are heat islands in our community and start to transform them. Uh, one place we can do that is the Center Street parking lot. And I've been working with others through that Small Business Development Committee to explore, and we funded this through ARPA funding, the early stages of an exploration of turning that into a town square, a green town square, and then um, putting up parking, only as much parking as we think we'll need in the future um, on one small part of that land, but Thank using you. the rest of it for the community. Tommy. I uh, thought my opponent would talk about transportation, this question, he's been one behind. Um, Look, I left my job uh, to take a job in the state legislature because I understood that the best way to fight climate change, the best way to reduce carbon emissions, is through policy, local, state, and federal level. My opponent didn't mention carbon emissions a single time in his answer. Carbon emissions is where it's at. CO2 is what drives climate change, as well as uh, methane emissions and a few other gases, but it's primarily CO2. Here are some of the things that I've done to reduce the emissions of CO2. Uh, before, as a, legislature, as a legislator, uh, I forced the retirement of coal-fired power plants for a living. Uh, I've done my share, but that's not enough. My share is not enough, right? I wrote the bylaw that created Brookline Green Energy. For those folks who have done nothing about their electric bill, you are getting 20% more renewables than you would otherwise because of the law that I wrote, and we're ratcheting it up. By this time next year, you will be 100% emissions-free energy. That's in Brookline, and that's the bill that I wrote. Brookline is now one of 10 communities who can require that new construction and gut renovations do not have uh, fossil fuel using heating systems. That idea was born on my porch. It made it through town meeting, and then we had to change state law to allow Brookline that authority, and we did. And don't think I wasn't in the room helping to make that happen as a climate expert and as the person from Brookline on whose porch the law was dreamed up in the first place. What's next? We need to implement our offshore wind. We need to push further in decarbonizing buildings. That's both new construction statewide as well as retrofits. We're going to EVs exclusively in 2035, but there's a lot of steps along the way, especially with charging, to make sure we get there. Thank you. Raul. Yeah, I'll, I'll just say it. I'll, for, I'll forgive my opponent for this because this is all moving very quickly. And the very first thing I said was about decarbonization, about the Zero Emissions Advisory Board and such, but it's okay. Um, you know, I'll say, you know, again, I think, I think we really need to focus on the spaces in our community that are right now heat islands, that are lots, and those tend to be disproportionately in the areas that are more likely to have the folks who are underpaid, um, the areas where there are more likely to be cars passing, um, spewing pollutants, there are more likely the buses passing through it, there as well. There's a lot that we could do in those particular spaces, and that's Thank where we need you. to focus our efforts. Heat, heat islands are a real problem, and there are things we should do to fix them. But that's a symptom. That's not treating the problem. The problem is emissions. And we need a legislature who knows how to fight emissions. I have testified in hearing rooms across the country on how to actually cut emissions in the power sector, on pipelines, on transmission. My wife builds green buildings for a living. She's an engineer as well. I'm leading in the legislature on decarbonizing our buildings. We've got to cut emissions. I'm the legislator who can get that done. Thank you. Now we are going to our lightning round. So this will go to Tommy first. These are 30 second answers. They can even be yes and no answers if you like, but I doubt that's gonna happen. I'm gonna throw a lot of issues at you and we're gonna see what you feel about them. So. Tommy first, first issue, fair share amendment. Yes or no? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I worked to collect signatures for it to get it on the ballot in the first place. Yes, I voted for it in the constitutional convention, necessary to change the state constitution to make it law. And yes, I voted for it in the second constitutional convention, also necessary to make it into law. Look, we need to fund education and transportation. We need to fund it from the folks who have the resources. The fair share amendment gets that done, and I ask you to vote for it on Tuesday, Bravo. November 8th. Bravo. 
All right, no daylight here. I've yes, I've uh, <laughs> campaigned for it. We'll continue campaigning for it after our election, uh, and and direct my efforts toward make sure it gets passed. Um, those are two of the areas, transportation and education, that have been woefully underfunded. Um, we see, um, you know, with our very eyes, what it looks like when you underfund transportation. What's harder to see, um, unless you have kids in the system or 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 an educator, is what the impacts are of underfunding in education. Um, we just had in our community uh, a, a, a school committee and a union fighting over a fraction of a percentage point um, for deserved wages for, for our right. educators. We should not have to do that. Our next issue goes to Raul first, universal school meals. Yes, absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> glad uh, that that is um, still law uh, now. Uh, and uh, and you know, if I'm the legislature, I will work to keep it law um, permanently. Um, I benefited when I was a kid um, from, from free summer meals that um, were honestly a lifeline uh, for my family. Uh, but having uh, kids have to show up and you know, show some proof that they, that they deserve a free meal or a reduced meal, I hope th those days are over, at least in Massachusetts. Tommy. Absolutely. Uh, I voted to support Breakfast After the Bell, and I co-sponsored and fought for and uh, successfully uh, voted in favor of the law that funds universal school meals for the next year. It's absolutely something we should keep. You know, uh, when I grew up near the end of the month, on the months that were tight, uh, your parents shopped at the local grocery store. But earlier in the month, because of food stamps, they shopped three grocery stores away so other folks wouldn't know. I know uh, what that food insecurity is like, and free school lunches are one way to fight it. Thank you. Uh, next issue goes to Tommy first, abortion rights. I'm proud to be endorsed by Reproductive Equity Now, the pro-choice powerhouse advocacy organization. I was there in the fight for the Roe Act two years ago that codified for the first time in Massachusetts history the right to an abortion. We did it the first session I got there. That it wasn't done before me, not my fault. Uh, and then this time, we passed an unbelievably great abortion law. Again, Kamala Harris came and visited to learn more about it, uh, and I was honored to speak with her about it. Raul. Um, so, absolutely, uh, we need to do everything we can to make sure that Massachusetts is a sanctuary state for those seeking abortions outside of Massachusetts that desperately uh, need one. Uh, I will say that we need to put millions of dollars into creating new clinics and building up the infrastructure. There was a very, you know, a relatively small amount of money put in this last leg legislative session. Glad it was. We need to put a lot more into that. Fighting these crisis pre pregnancy centers, these CPCs, and making sure that they're not a allowed to, to tell mistruths about what it is that they actually do, uh, and making sure that we are also concerned with maternal Next. morbidity, including black Too maternal morbidity, morbidity as well. Next to Tommy. Um, I'm sorry, uh, next to our old, right, right. Yeah. immigrant driver's licenses. Absolutely, um, and you know, it's, it's um, I really hope that we don't have to have this fight all over again. Um, this is something that is absolutely important. Um, folks in our community, regardless of their documentation status, deserve to be treated like full participants in our communities. That means driver's licenses, that means access to the same tuition levels at our public colleges that, that, that other uh, residents get. Um, and that also means, frankly, uh, I believe that um, those without citizenship should also be able to vote, at least in our local elections, because they too um, have kids in the schools, get their trash picked Tommy. up, and all the things that anyone else yeah. does. Uh, look, uh, immigrants are part of our community and should be treated as full members of our community. Everyone should have the right to wait in line at the RMV. Uh, and if you get in a crash, you don't get to choose who it's with. You want that other person to have insurance. And the Work and Family Mobility Act, uh, the bill that I voted for that the governor uh, uh, ended up uh, into law one way or another, uh, did just that. Uh, yes, it is likely to be on the ballot in November. And uh, if it is, I hope that you will reject the efforts to repeal the ability next. for citizens to have driver's licenses. Our next issue uh, goes to Tommy first. No cost phone calls for people in prisons and jails. You bet. Uh, of course, in the last statement, I meant to say non-citizens to have driver's licenses. I supported the no cost phone calls. Uh, look, if you want people who are incarcerated to get to a better place and to get out of jail or prison and fully re-enter in society, you've got to keep them connected with the family. And no-cost phone calls are an easy way to do it. Uh, we funded the backfill-in funding so that 
we could have no-cost phone calls. Uh, and, uh, mm -hmm. and I believe in them. Right. Come back in formal session. Bring it back. Pass it. If there's a veto, override it. Get this thing done. And if you, and if you, if you can't do that, I, I don't know what we're talking about here. This is, we talk about criminal here. This is criminal. It is the folks, the families of the people who have been incarcerated. Um, including folks that have not yet been uh, uh, convicted of anything that are bearing the cost of these calls, which are exorbitant. It is totally unfair. It needs to end. Uh, next issue to Raul first, crime gun data analysis bill. Yeah. Uh, well, let me tell you this much. I mean, you know that I've done a lot of work on, um, on, on policing and public safety in our community. Um, and we certainly you know, need to make sure that we're doing everything we can um, to get guns off the street. But what I need uh, for us to do is to take uh, a perspective that is not a police first perspective, that we really need to start investing upstream rather than downstream on these issues. We spent too much money addressing the symptoms of problems rather address than addressing the root causes of these problems. This is something I'd like to talk more about if I have time. Yeah. <laughs> Tommy. Yeah, I'm a Moms Demand Action candidate because I want to work to having fewer guns in our communities. and. Uh, I think it's important to consider a whole variety of ideas that get us there. And look, data analysis is part of that. We need to better understand the details in order uh, to make good policy and to enforce good policy. And so sign me up for anything that reduces the prevalence of guns in our communities and keeps us safer. Okay, next issue goes to Tommy first. Same day voter registration. You bet. Uh, I voted for it. We, um, the Votes Act came through the legislature this session. I'm the vice chair of election laws uh, and worked very hard on this very issue. Uh, we had only gotten several votes in favor of it in the past. Uh, we got, uh, I think, over 60 votes on the floor this time. The fact of the matter is I voted for it. It simply didn't have the votes. We, that's what we do. We count the votes. We take the votes. It didn't pass. I'm going to work on it again next wow. session and try to get it there. I, you know, the only reason to block same-day voter registration is to protect incumbency, to protect folks like um, like my opponent here. Um, of uh, the, the vote that he's talking about was a vote to actually um, uh, not block deliberation, uh, to to prevent deliberation from happening. Um, there should be an opportunity to deliberate it, but frankly, this should be a no-brainer. Um, folks in our community need it. Anyone who actually moves on September first. Uh, is and which is so many people because of displacement, because of college students, et cetera, um, are disproportionately impacted by the inability to vote and to register Next. and vote on the same day. Next issue goes to Raul first. Uh, limits on the use of facial surveillance. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I you know we worked on this locally. I uh, was glad to be a champion for um, putting the pause and, and banning face surveillance here in Brookline. Um, I would continue to support it um, at the state level. Um, there, there is. Um, there, there are very few reasons why we would need face surveillance and certainly none that are compelling to me um, as to why we would roll out face surveillance um, broadly in our communities. Um, it is something um, that, is, that is anathema to, um, to the way that we live our lives. Tommy. Yeah, you know, uh, a decade ago I was working with Brookline PACs and folks like Clint Richmond uh, to reduce cameras in Brookline and we eventually came to a compromise where uh, those traffic cameras were shielded during the day and available to the police only uh, in an emergency during the day. Uh, absolutely, I oppose uh, facial surveillance. I've worked with folks at the ACLU and I've worked with our Senator Cindy Cream, also an endorser uh, on restricting and limiting the use of facial surveillance. Uh, it's just way out of bounds. It's way too intrusive and we don't need it. We are now going to move to closing statements. So our first closing statement will come from Tommy. With me, you know what you get. You've seen me walking my kids to Pierce School in the morning, meeting with people at coffee shops, riding my bike or the tea, meeting with friends and neighbors in the community on nights and weekends, and supporting campaigns to renovate our schools. This isn't an election about values. Either way, you're going to elect a Democrat who is a lefty, a liberal, a progressive. This election is about leadership style. I spent 15 years in Brookline's town meeting, passing local legislation, restricting tobacco sales, protecting town employees at work, 
creating Brookline's green electricity program. I learned that you achieve lasting success by finding ways to work with people rather than emphasizing disagreement, reaching out, building relationships, collaborating. And don't take my word for it. Trust the very people who my opponent and I have served with in local government. Six out of the seven select board members who served with my opponent and the one who replaced him have all endorsed my campaign. 80% of townwide elected officials are supporting me and good luck getting 75% of town meeting to agree on much, but they agree that Tommy Vitolo is Brookline's best shot at state representative. It's not just local groups though. Reproductive Equity Now, the state's pro-choice powerhouse has endorsed me. So too has Sierra Club and the Environmental League of Massachusetts, climate powerhouses. The powerhouses of our economy, unions, have endorsed me by more than a three to one ratio. And my favorite powerhouse, Maura Healy, our next governor, she too has endorsed me. The folks who know my opponent and I best are backing me. The folks in the state who best represent Brooklyn's values are also supporting me. Serving at the legislature has been the honor of my life, but our work isn't done. And so I'm asking you to support me as well. I'm asking you to vote in the Democratic primary on September 6th for me, Tommy Vitolo. And if you want to vote before then, great news. A law that the legislature passed this session, a law that I helped shepherd as vice chair uh, of the Joint Committee on Election Laws, allows you to do that. You can vote early by mail, and you can also vote early in person starting Saturday at Town Hall. I wanna thank you for watching. I wanna thank Brookline Interactive Group for being such an important member of our community. Thank you to Cindy and the Brookline Democratic Town Committee. And please do say hi if you see me on the streets. Thank you. Raul. Sure, thank you. Thank you to our moderator, to the Democratic Town Committee and BIG for hosting this debate, and to you for your time and attention. Uh, this election has real stakes, and my opponent and I are offering two different visions of our role for state that a state rep should play. My opponent's vision is about building relationships with people who already hold the most power, and especially with state house bosses. That's why his first votes in the legislature were against common sense transparency amendments, which are part of our Democratic Party platform. Um, what we didn't get to today is that my opponent two weeks ago called on me to release the questionnaires that we, that we submitted. Might have been on my website since earlier that morning before he called for it. Um, his are still yet to appear. Uh, my opponent has not promoted this debate, didn't promote the last one either. Um, begs the question, does, what doesn't he want you to see here? Um, there are no policy positions on his website. Um, and, you know, bottom line is how you campaign is how you will govern. Uh, well, we already know um, how Tommy Vitolo legislates. We also see now how he campaigns. My approach, meanwhile, is about building coalitions of directly impacted people inside and outside of government to push my colleagues for change, not just behind closed doors, but where our constituents can see where we stand. Sometimes this means voting in the minority. I was proud to stand with older adults fighting for a property tax exemption to help people age in place in their homes, even though I was the only select board member to vote for it but I've done more than just vote the right way. I'm incredibly proud of how much we've accomplished as a town during my time on the select board. I convened and led groups to secure funding for public housing renovations, to expand our safety net fund, to reimagine policing and to support local businesses and nonprofits throughout the ongoing pandemic. Each has delivered real policy successes that have changed the lives of people in Brookline for the better. One of the best examples is my work to bring a just end to the persecution of Gerald Alston by our select board. Gerald was a Brookline firefighter who faced racial harassment and spent more than a decade seeking restitution. I pledged to work with town meeting members and racial justice advocates to make it right, and we did. And what did my opponent do? He took the politically safe path, staying quiet throughout the entire saga. I'm honored, honored that Gerald chose to share his experience in the Brookline patch this week, saying that he sees this election as a choice between political courage and political convenience. In the toughest conversations, I've been right there working to make progress. We could have used a state rep on our side, but ours was never there when we needed him. And that's why I'm running to replace him. Listen, there's no trade-off between standing up for what you believe and getting important things done. My time in Brookline has shown me they go together. The approach can work in the legislature too. It's how Sonia Chang Diaz, who's endorsed me, has got the Our Student Opportunity Act passed, transforming education in Massachusetts. Let me close with this. Gerald said in his op-ed that Brookline in the end is a town that chooses justice, courage, and moral clarity. We need a state representative that does the same. 
That's what these times demand, and that's what our community deserves. If you agree, I humbly ask for your vote on or before September 6th. Thank you. Thank you to the candidates tonight and to Brookline Interactive Group. And remember, you can vote by mail, you can vote early at Town Hall, or you can vote on Election Day, Tuesday, September 6th, from 7 a.m. till 8 p.m. If you want to see this debate again or tell others about it, you can find the recording on brooklineinteractive.org. Thank you and good night.